So I hadn't, we hadn't mentioned it earlier, but this is the uh, Brain Injury in Children and Youth, a manual for educators. Um, if you guys don't know about this resource, it's a great resource. All of the information that we're talking about is in here. Obviously, we're going much more in depth with our presentation today, but it is a wonderful resource, and um, this next section is all color-coded, um, and it mirrors in, that, in the manual so that you guys can, um, at, e at your leisure, go through and, yes, hang on, um, make sure you're utilizing that resource. Actually, mine is just a compliment. That manual is wonderful. It is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> did you hear that, Karen? <laughs> we, we did spend a lot of time on that, and we're actually um, going to revise it and add some more stuff to it, but thank you for that. It is, a, it is a wonderful resource, so make sure you guys are using it. So when we look at the typical ways um, that um, our brain develops and the typical impacts, uh, one way to understand the developing brain um, and through the, the typical impacts is through the hierarchy of neurocognitive development. And that's what this pyramid kind of represents, is this hierarchy of how uh, processes and skills in our brain develop and can be impacted. But it's a really good way to try to understand and help our teams um, understand that we really do have to drill down. It's not just about starting at that higher order level, which is the emotional, social, behavioral level, which is typically what we get, right? Is we, we have teachers call us in and say, come and get this kid out of my classroom because he's behaviorally blah, 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 fill in the blank. And this is where we, as special education teams, need to really make sure we're drilling down and we're really, truly identifying what is at play here. Yes, it could be a social impact. Yes, it could be a behavioral regulation piece. But what are some of the underlying, more foundational skills that could be um, areas of deficit as well? So this helps us understand kind of how that, um, or one way to understand how that works. So when we look at all of the orange, again, it's color-coded to, to help us kind of figure this out, all of those orange levels, we're really looking at um, the things that are really highly, highly sensitive to brain injury. And when I also, again, remember I'm talking brain injury and it's all acquired brain injuries, traumatic and non-traumatic, but it's all those congenital areas to, these are mirroring um, all of those areas of deficit. So it, um, apply this broadly. Um, we're really looking at attention, processing speed, memory, and sensory motor. These are the things that are highly, highly uh, sensitive to brain injury. And you will see some impact, whether it be for a few moments or longer term, but you'll see some impact in this with a brain injury. These are also obviously crucial building blocks for learning. All learning, all behavior, right, <laughs> is our brain, correct? And attention, memory, sensory motor, and processing speed are all integral to learning. When we look at the next levels, that intermediate processes level, that is going to be um, all language, so receptive, expressive, and that social pragmatic piece. Don't forget that social pragmatic piece. Um, and also all new learning, as well as visual spatial. So everything that's coming into play Again, those building blocks on that foundational level are feeding. If that, if that foundational level is unsteady or there's gaps in that, of course you're going to have some gaps in this next level too because it is building upon that. And it's drawing from all of those foundational skills to help with understanding of new learning, understanding of language, that kind of a thing. Of course, we get to the next level, that whole a higher order processes level, and that includes all behavioral and all social emotional stuff, which is huge, as we know. And it's so big that there's a whole chapter dedicated in the manual <laughs> to social emotional and that higher order thinking world. What also is included in that um, is that executive functioning, all of those frontal lobe 
uh, types of processes that happen um, and that develop. Remember, we have that later development process in our frontal lobes. That's where that, um, those processes lie in that higher order thinking. And of course, we're all striving as educators for the overall functioning, all of these things working in concert, all of these things coming together the way they need to come together to make sure that we have highest functioning kids. They're able not only to do academic um, and achievement types lev type levels, but they're also able to do living skills, budgeting, all the things that we do as adults or young adults, perhaps, right after school, um, and all of our transition skills, all of those things, being able to work in a work environment, that kind of a thing. So that is, that is a difficult thing to put together for even a typical developing kid, let alone a student with brain injury. And something to be noted, when we look at these, the, the criteria, and you've got the, um, the determination page for TBI. We sent that to you guys on, your, um, on the confirmation email. If you look at the TBI criteria, it mirrors this exactly. And there's also something to be said about educational impact, and we'll get into it in a little bit more detail later on, but educational impact is just that. It's the whole big picture, right? We're not just talking about TCAPs. We're talking about social, we're talking about emotional, we're talking about all of those things that make a learner. Um, executive function is one of those huge areas um, that can be very impactful for students, but it's not going to show up, perhaps, on a TCAP score, right? So when we talk about educational impact, we really are talking about that big, broad look. So let's get into, briefly, <clears throat> the definitions of these worlds. So you also have the matrix in front of you. All of this is mirrored in that as well, um, alongside the uh, educational determination sheet for TBI. So attention and concentration is impacted much of the time with brain injury. And if you think about it's the inability to inhibit an impulse, um, the problem with attention is often underlying issue with attention deficit disorder. So you see ADHD at play, perhaps, in this world, but it's about that inhibition. And you might get diagnoses of ADHD um, when we see an, a deficit in this area, it may or may not be attributed to a brain injury, but that's something that could be, definitely. So always, always keep that in mind. And what do we do for attention deficit or ADHD? Meds, typically, right? And stimulants. And in that stimulant world, with introducing a stimulant to a, a brain that's been injured, may or may not respond the same way. So. If we have a student that's identified as, with ADHD and meds aren't working, like typically, there might be something else at play. May or may not be a brain injury, right? But may or be, may be something else at play. So something to think about with attention. Memory, again, another very high, um, highly sensitive area. Crucial building block for learning, right? How am I supposed to know to remember what happened, what I learned about last year. Attach that and build on that with the current learning and or predict what's going to happen in the future based on that learning. We always ask kids to do that connection. Prior knowledge, what I'm learning now, and perhaps predict what's gonna happen next. Memory is key. It's also um, involved in the storage and organization of that information. So how we're able to retrieve um, the right information. Karen mentioned, er, mentioned earlier the hallmark of brain injury is unevenness, being able to, to pull up information on one day, perhaps not the next. That could be a memory issue and a retrieval issue um, versus willful behavior, <laughs> if you will. Processing speed. Um, Highly sensitive, again, um, teens are rarely aware of this. They might say, wow, things are just harder. They seem harder for me. And to think about the hustle and bustle of our daily world, um, and you think about a 30-second kid in a two-second world, or maybe even a 
five minute kid in a two second world trying to maintain, trying to not only pay attention to the right stuff, but do it quick enough to where they can actually keep up and maintain and not look stupid in front of their peers or um, et cetera, et cetera, where we might see behavior. Um, I often think about the, um, our old dial up modems, you know, where they, we used to hear all the clicks and the beeps and the ching, 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 and then we'd connect. That's kind of where our kids are. Now it's Wi-Fi, right? It's instantaneous. And that's the world that we live in, yet we still have dial-up types of kids out there as far as uh, lag time and, work, and uh, working to keep up. Sensory motor is our last area for this fundamental uh, processes level. And that is um, just that being comfortable in your own skin kind of a thing. Where, do, where else do we see a sensory motor kind of issue come, up, come about usually? And what other categories or what other um, special education worlds? Autism. Autism, right? Where the student is worried about the seam on their sock because they can feel it and that's all they can think about. Or the tag in the back of their shirt. Or the lights are too bright or the street noise is too loud out the window, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is something that cannot be um, selective, selectively um, um, discarded in some of our, in, with some of our students. So if we think about trying to pay attention to the right stuff and concentrate on the right stuff, that's going to be a barrier. So on to the next level, that intermediate level. And all new learning, all learning processes, when we think about um, presenting new information, new concepts. And this is where we do see um, the unevenness as well. So when we think about brain injury and a child's performance in an uneven way, um, and be able to kind of pull all those things together and apply it to new learning, it really is evident. And it drives teachers crazy, <laughs> does it not? So probably the the worst thing, other than behavior perhaps, but this could cause behavior, um, is this unevenness thing. And we can think about and, and look at different examples of this. We can look about across domains. So I might have a 10-year-old and expressively um, in, the, in the language domain, pretty typical 10-year-old, but social emotional regulation might be functioning as a four-year-old. So across domains, it could be within domains, that language uh, piece is a, a really good um, example of that, and very evident in FASD as well, where they look expressively pretty typical, but receptively very low. They're not truly understanding what is being said to them or asked of them. So something to think about by way of unevenness. The other way we think about that too is from day to day. From day to day, we may, again, have a kid that, sorry, um, that is able to come up and re retrieve the right information to the same question on Monday. You ask them again on Thursday, and it's not able to be, <laughs> to be there. It's just not retrievable. So again, unevenness across time could be an example of that as well. Yes? Yes, good, very good point. And, and we're actually going to talk about more about that learning uh, or that language um, impairment piece also. And true, I, I mean, when we think about that, it really is viewed as oppositional, right? It's, it's not, it's a willful behavior. It's not, I know you had this answer to this exact question two days ago. It's got to be behavior. It's got to be willfulness, right, at play. Visual spatial processing. Um, this is another area that could be very impacted. And we think about a, a very easy example of this is not being able to line up a math problem correctly, right? If we don't line it up correctly in the get-go, there's no way we're getting to the right answer, right? So when we think about spatially 
and visually processing our information in the correct way. And there's some easy ways that we can address that and strategies with graph paper, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also spatially in our bodies. We know that those, some of those kids that, <laughs> that just don't know where I end and you begin kind of a thing. So you could see it in that um, type of world as well. Again, the language pro yes. Um, we don't I have it. Back on the other one, the, I, the piece that you uh -huh. had but didn't mention, um, we, I see this a lot. Um, the, when they can't have visual spatial understanding, um, they don't get subtle social cues. And so that looks very behavioral, but they don't, it, it's just, they're missing that ability to figure that out. And they verbally, they may be good, so they can talk a good game, but they, mm -hmm. they really don't get the subtleties of what's going on. Exactly. And how do we learn a lot of the time? <coughs> through, our, through our models, correct? So if we're misinterpreting or not even interpreting at all those social cues, what other people are doing around me so that I can learn the norms, those kinds of things, definitely can come across as behavior. Also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss this. Um, when we are um, thinking about those social cues, we, we might also have a kid that interprets facial expressions completely differently. So I might be frustrated, and that kid sees hate, and therefore it you know, responds aggressively because they think they're in danger or something like that. So there's really... Um, subtle things that could be missed in this area that can end up in not so subtle consequences. <laughs> so definitely something to keep in mind. Thank you. So the language processes, and, and again, Tammy's going to get into more of this, but again, all three, receptive, expressive, and social pragmatic, um, are key to making sure that we are uh, assessing in the right way and really drilling down in those areas of what is that impact. And that pragmatic piece is sometimes left out. Again, that pragmatic piece is those social cues, the social language that we use every day. We think about schools, it is a very social area. <laughs> maintaining in a classroom, maintaining in the hallways, maintaining in the cafeteria, on the playgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about social interaction and social cues uh, much of the time. So. Speaking of social, when we go to the next level in these higher order thinking um, areas, that social emotional competency, again, huge, huge areas and huge areas of impact. And this can um, get kids really, really in trouble. When we think about juvenile justice worlds, um, we think about DYC is in the house, I know. Um, <laughs> we think about those things that are um, social and, um, and really build on competence or rely on competencies to maintain and manage, especially as a student is growing older and we're not acting as the frontal lobes as we do with younger students. Um, we expect them to be able to, to have some of those things. And we've, we know that those executive functioning worlds and reasoning and judgment and all of those things are in development, but we expect a high level of access of those competencies as kids get older. So very impactful world if kids are not able to maintain in this, um, could be very, very, very detrimental to a student. And then all of the executive function. Now, I tell you all, but it's not, <laughs> this is not an exhaustive list by all means. Please know that. These are the typical areas. It, it, there may be other ones that are pulled in, um, but these are the areas that we've pulled out as, as the highest impacted and the typically impacted as well as, um, and that's why it mirrors that uh, TBI category um, as far as criteria goes. So when we look at executive functioning, we've pulled out reasoning um, as one of those, and it really is consideration of evidence and drawing conclusions. Um, that is, it's all about learning, right? And it's all about impacting um, our learning. We think about Mental flexibility, another area that has seen across the autism spectrum, right, around being able to shift. It's not only shifting from one room to another, a physical space environment to another, 
and being able to um, kind of reconcile that in your brain. Um, but it's also shifting from task to task. So when we talk about you know, breaking tasks down into little chunks, we're asking kids perhaps to transition more, but in, with easier content in front of them, lesser things to pay attention to perhaps. So there's lots to think about by way of classroom routines and how that helps in an executive functioning world. Planning. Being able to set a goal, identify a sequence, and, um, and, and act to reach that goal. Is there a question? Sorry. I just have a thought in my head. Um, I've just been reading about the new numbers on <clears throat> autism identification that they have increased from what we even thought they were. Yes. And I'm just wondering if somehow, since autism is up there so much in the forefront, if maybe we aren't really looking at traumatic brain injury for some kids and it's going under the label of autism. Yeah, and there might be some, um, some merit in that thinking. So yeah, just, just last night and this morning, if you were, had the TV on, <laughs> you probably saw the new, new numbers for autism as 1 in 62. Yeah, so um, again, huge jump. Um, and double that for males. That it, Males was like 1 in 40 something. And females is still higher, like 1 in 150 or 140, something like that. But overall, that 1 in 62 is now um, what we're <laughs> being told by way of autism. Um, another thing that's recently come out is the use of Tylenol in when you're pregnant is causing ADHD. Tylenol has been the only safe drug, <laughs> really, truly, that you can take when you're pregnant, right? And now they're saying, and it's not just one use, they're saying that over sev all three trimesters at some point in time um, is the research now that it's linked to um, high, high um, ADHD diagnoses levels. So, um, so lots and lots of stuff coming out, still a lot of unknowns about, but I, I think we're getting better at it. And, and, and you guys, I think, have, have the right tools um, to kind of weave through the, all of that information. Because that's what's going to be key, that you guys put your detective hats on to know, let's ask the right questions. Let's make sure we're taking into consideration all things so that we're not misdiagnosing or misidentifying. Remember, as educators, we don't diagnose, but we might be doing an educational identification of autism. We want to make sure that we're asking questions around brain injury. We want to make sure that we're teasing apart what truly is going on, definitely. So being able to plan and organize, organize our environments, our activities, our thoughts, the information in our head, being able to retrieve um, the information in an organized manner, that kind of a thing, um, all at play. And I, I can't <laughs> say enough. When it, Many, many parents um, that call in or, or I talk with um, in this world of brain injury say they, they, they express their frustration with, if I have one more special ed teacher tell me that organizational skills is my student's backpack, I'm going to come across the table. I mean, there's just that it seems like as educators, we think about organizing our materials, being able to get our, our homework in the right spot doing it, bringing it back, checking in in the right, right? So organizing our materials, making sure we can access our materials to do what we need to do. Much, much broader application of organizational skills when we think about organizing our thoughts um, and all of all, everything that we have to do. When we think about a secondary world, I'm now in at least four teachers' classrooms, if not eight, right? And it might be every other day if you guys are on block schedules. And I have to go from one area to the other with a very busy, very loud, very physically um, challenging, perhaps, hallway in between, or a number of hallways in between. And I'm supposed to get all of my information that I need to for this classroom 
and then make it to this other classroom with the right information there and the right folder and the right pencil or pen and the <laughs> right books um, and be ready to learn when I sit down. And that's a huge managing of our environment, not to mention socially and emotionally <laughs> and reading people's faces so that I know not to strike out because I feel threatened. All of those things come to play. Not only um, that, but when I open a secondary textbook, what do I see? Everything under the moon, right? I see a chart here, a graph here, a quote here, a picture here, some text here, and then maybe some key things pulled out into the margin, perhaps. Um, and I'm supposed to organize all of that information into key understandings and take that and do something with it. So the ability to kind of focus in, and this comes into play with the visual spatial world as well, document cameras can be a very useful tool. If I've got a document camera and I'm just, I'm able to focus in on exactly what I want them to focus on versus the seven other things on that one page, or create my assessments in a way that really gives them the, the integral piece of information that I want them to focus on, we could really help in that attention world, the visual spatial managing, um, all of those worlds, as well as organization and executive function. Initiation, the ability to start an activity. And we see kids sometimes saying, you know, if we give a direction as a teacher, you know, get your math books out, turn to page 122, get your pen out and your homework from last night. And processing speed's not there, attention's not on the right stuff perhaps, I'm way behind, and initiation may be at play where I don't even have the capacity, the mental function, to start a task. So I'm sitting there, you're thinking that I know what you're, what you're saying, and you're not doing what I've asked you to do drives teachers nuts. It really could be initiation at play where the, the mental function is not even there to start the activity. So and then we get up to that overall functioning level. As long as all of these things are playing in concert, working together, we've got all of those foundational skills solidly built, there's no gaps. We've got all of the intermediate levels solidly built, there's no gaps. We can get to the social emotional regulation piece. It's out of the way. We can get to achievement and adaptive skills um, aligned. So when we think about transition and adaptive skills and vocational um, abilities, all of these things need to work in concert. And many times we have lots and lots of gaps. So we have this kind of wobbly foundation, if you will, that kids are teetering on. Um, and that's why it's important for us to really know how to get at those deeper uh, processes going on, how to make sure that we're identifying the right stuff so that we can address that accordingly. And of course, overall achievement. And we have a switch gears here. Okay, so why do we go into all this detail about all of the foundational skills? Because likely, when you get called in and you're asked to consult on these kids, what you're getting asked about is the tippy top of, you know, that, you know, that, you've seen that picture with the glacier, right? And all you see is that little top part that's sticking out of the water and underneath is all of this. Almost always, if you take Heather's um, case where she talked about all the different classes that this child has to organize and get to, um, and get across campus with all the right materials at the right time, eventually, if this child can't get him or herself organized to do that, what are they going to do? They're going to stop going to class. And when this comes to you, it's going to be because this child is not attending class. It's going to be a behavior. If you take the initiation um, example she gave you, this child can't get started, couldn't catch the directions. What page was it? What was I supposed to pull out? So. In order to not look different than anybody else, they can create some kind of disruption, and then it becomes a behavior issue. They get sent out of the classroom, and then it never shows that they couldn't get themselves initiated. So on the tippy top of almost all of this is behavior. And 
or learning, but primarily behavior. And that is why we spend so much time trying to get you to see underneath the water. Because likely with our kids with TBI, ABI, FASD, autism, likely it's deficits and skills underneath that are causing the inability to really have the solid skills on the top and or are just resulting in some behaviors or some learning issues that are going kind of unrecognized as a disability but more willful disobedience. So, um, so when, when we had the opportunity to start moving forward with TBI, we said, okay, this is great. If we can actually now train teams on med, um, medical documentation and or credible history as evident and educational impact as evidenced by all these different areas, which Heather has just laid out for you from the bottom up, great. We can go ahead and staff these kids and then what? If we were to staff a child into your district right now with traumatic brain injury, do you have a TBI classroom you're going to send them to? Do you have TBI teachers who are going to just say thank you, here's, okay, take them off and now come up with the plan form, right? This is an eligibility label that doesn't come with a place or a person to manage. So then we had to sort of think through, what does this mean? We definitely want to do the right thing and look at these kids from the lens of traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury or FASD and help these kids, but we don't really have a specific person or place to, that's going to help you know, to manage that. So you take this very complicated scenario that Heather has just laid out for you, and then you throw in one other thing called setting events. Setting events are they are any kind of um, internal or external, but primarily internal um, conditions that will make your, your typical cause and effect reinforcers and consequences ineffective. Okay? And they are very, very typical for kids who have medical conditions and or congenital and or brain injury conditions. All right? They're often things like fatigue or the petit mal seizures or taking num a number of um, medications. And so that would even be for our kids with um, mental health issues that are on three different medications where that might make them have kind of not feel so good in their stomach or have a little bit of that fogginess in their head. Um, you have the kids with autism on the spectrum. They have sensory overload. You have kids with traumatic brain injury. They have sensory underload. All of these things internally, you also have to be very well aware of the fact that even though you might come put, up, put together the best program for these kids, they ha there are other internal and medical conditions that are kind of making this harder for you. The, um, the example that I always give is that um, I have been teaching at the UCB school psych program and I will, um, and I teach on all DSM for school psychologists basically, and I will have my students um, do a functional behavior assessment and a behavior intervention plan for a student who refuses to eat. So the, the story is um, a, a, little, a boy named Christopher, he comes to school, some days he eats, some days he doesn't eat, and the teachers are concerned, the parents are concerned, so put together an FBA and, and a BIP for this kid who will not eat. And so my diligent, really good students, they go out and they do all their research and they do all the things you do with an FBA BIP and they come up with these brilliant plans. And then we read the book, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. How many of you have read that book? It is a book written in the first person by a, a young man who, in the end, I think we would say is on the spectrum, Asperger's or autism, and it's from his perspective, right? And an incident happens, and, and you see why he makes the decisions he makes, and why, on the outside, these decisions make no sense to us. But to him, they make all the sense in the world, right? There are days where he gets up, and on the school bus, if he sees a yellow car, car, it's a bad day. If you see two yellow cars in a row, it's a bad, bad day. If you see three yellow cars in a row, by the time you get to school, it is one of those days where you do not eat. You just don't eat that day. Now that's a setting event. That is something that no matter how brilliant my school psych students are, they will never be able to figure out that because he's not going to disclose that to you. 
And it's not even, with many of our kids on the spectrum, it's not, or even OCD kinds of issues, it's not that they don't disclose it to you because sometimes they know that that's kind of strange and they don't want to disclose it to you. Sometimes they don't disclose it to you because you didn't ask them. How would you know to ask a kid, are you not eating today because it's a super bad day and you saw three yellow cars on the way to school today? That is the only time they're going to give you the answer. It's not that they're withholding information from you. They're just concrete thinkers. If you ask me, I'll tell you. Too bad you didn't know to ask me about the three yellow cards. So therefore, we never get to what's the FBA, what's the BIP, how do we remedy this problem of a kid not eating. That's kind of the life that we're getting into here with these kinds of kids. Um, it's very fun. You have to be very creative. But it's very challenging. So the other thing that on top of already a very complicated situation, you have to be aware of these setting events and these medical issues. And what it will do is make all of the higher order thinking, all of the cognitive skills, adaptive skills, and achievement skills, which we're supposed to be assessing with our TCAPs, very hard to do. Because we're wobbly underneath. All right? So then, of course, what we're going to talk about with the rest of today is how do you drill down and really solidify some of those foundational skills. And all day long, we're going to ask you to go back and forth from having really this full you know, bird's eye view of a, of a student because you're seeing this big picture of how this really impacts them in their life. And it's not coming down to just one test score. But then you also then have to drill it down to what is that one foundational area where we have to start our interventions, start your interventions, and then look wide again. So it really does take a village. It takes, the, it takes an entire team, which is why we talk about teams for you guys to go back and create your teams. It isn't something that one teacher can do. It isn't something that one parent can do. If we really want to be effective with very foundational skills, this is something that we have to share the responsibility on. Um, so we're, we're going back and forth, juggling both the bird's eye view and then narrowing it down to specific interventions, stepping back, looking at the bird's eye view again. And it really does take this ongoing assessment and the patience of a team and everybody working together for this, for this new label of TBI to be very effective. Um, and nobody who really takes it on and claims it as their own. So when we had kind of the opportunity to say, OK, how are we going to roll this out? We thought, well, if we, just, if we had a label, and Peter and I were talking about this earlier, if we had a label where you just did eligibility and you said, OK, my job is to help with eligibility. Here's the, here's the stamp of approval. Now you give it to a SED teacher or you give it to an SLD teacher. They take that student and they create the plan around them. We don't have that with TBI. We don't have rooms where these kids go, right? So what's our team? How are we going to really manage these kids? We started looking at the different models of teams out there. And this comes from the medical world. We're going to throw out some different ideas here. I want you to think about what you're doing in your schools. I want you to think about if any of these creative different ways would be um, interesting for you to think about in your schools and to adapt. Because working with our kids, our complicated kids, not just TBI, is going to require some thinking differently, thinking act, or practicing smarter, because um, these are complicated kids. So we looked at multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary in the medical setting comes from kind of the idea where many different disciplines, cardiology, endocrinology, uh, psychiatry, everybody takes a look at one, one patient and says, OK, from my specialty area, this is what I see. This is what I think needs to be done. So the, the example that um, we've been using through this whole training is when my dad got very ill. He was 83. He got very ill. And we, you know how it is when you have a, a family member in the hospital. You're at the hospital. You're waiting to talk to all the doctors, right? They always come at like 530 in the morning. And if you miss them, you miss them for the day. They won't call you, right? So we're always there in the, in the hospital 530 in the morning. And the cardiologist comes at 530. And he says, yes, your father's heart is this, this, and this. And this is the medication. Then he leaves. Then the endocrinologist comes. And he sees my dad. And he says, OK, here's the medications that he needs. This, this, and this, he tells us. And he leaves. And then psychiatry comes and says, he's starting to have you know, some memory issues. So here's what we do. This, this, and this. And then they leave. And they're giving all this information to the family members. And somehow, we're supposed to figure out how this medication doesn't interact with that medication. And when you give that medication, and maybe we should drop that medication. It's a multidisciplinary team approach that is given to 
somebody to try to figure out, okay? Um, obviously, really rich in information. These doctors are, are incredible at what they do, but difficult for us as family members to figure out. So it's all around this one person, right? In schools, how does this play out? Well, in my experience, the way that we would do a lot of our assessments, initials and triennials, is a multidisciplinary team approach. As a psychologist, I would go in and I would do my WISC, and the speech language person would go in and they would do their self, and the special ed teacher would go in and she'd do the Woodcock Johnson, and we would all take a look at this kid from our different lens and then we would all come together at one meeting and say, here's what I think, here's what I think, here's what I think. And somebody would put it together and say, here's the plan, right? There's not a lot of coordination in that. The only coordination really that I had to do as a psychologist was that, was to make sure that I was letting the speech language person know that I was here on Thursdays and I had to test that kid on this Thursday. Don't test that kid on that Thursday because that's the day I'm going to test the kid, right? And then we couldn't really talk to each other and the time-wise and you know, issues. And so then you'd come into the staffing and you'd all give your brilliant information and boom, somebody would put, you know, speech language or LD would take that information and you'd walk out. We're not gonna have that with TBI. You have lots of rich information, but nobody's gonna be able to pull that together and take that out and put together the plan. So multidisciplinary, great approach, but let's think a little wider. Transdisciplinary in a medical setting comes from this idea that these different disciplines then are going to um, basically kind of train a, another person to, to do parts of what each one of the, what they do. So you take it, you, you take it to the next, to the next step. You carry it to, over to the other side so that everybody sort of, somebody is kind of coordinating this. In my dad's situation, once we all decided he needed to go to rehab, he went to a rehab hospital, and the PT said, I want, you, I want these things worked on for walking, and the OT said, I want these things worked on for eating, and the speech language said, I want these things worked on for cognition and language, and they taught it all to the CNA. The only person that really worked with my dad every day was the CNA, who made sure that when he was eating, the OT's you know, goals were there. When he was walking, he was doing it properly with his walker, okay? So that concept of taking your different areas and bringing it into one person, usually of not of the same level, but of a different lower level discipline, and helps to make that happen through the day. All right? In the world of education, transdisciplinary came in under the child find, and a lot of early education teams started doing transdisciplinary teams where everybody takes a look at this child all at the same time. So different than the multidisciplinary, if you've ever done a transdisciplinary assessment, they are so much fun, right? You're in there with your colleagues, you're all looking together, and then, but you're still looking from your lens, and then you, you kind of create a plan together and write a joint report. And then the, the early educator is the one that kind of makes sure that that happens through the day. So you kind of create, you give, you give it to someone to make it happen and implement it daily. So we do have transdisciplinary in our settings in terms of education, if we were to do a transdisciplinary and we're going to take all of our information and then train it to somebody, who would that usually be in education? A gen ed teacher, a sped teacher. If we're going to give it, yeah, if we're going to give it to, to someone, like a, lab, like a special ed teacher to do, to oversee, but really, is she going to do all of that or who does she train? The aid. There's often a para, right? If we have complicated kids, we'll have then we will teach a para to do some things, right? Well, I don't know about your districts, but the idea of staffing kids into to TBI and thinking there's going to be a para for them is just not realistic, right? I used, to, I used to direct the TBI team in my district and people would call me up and say, I want to staff this kid TBI because that means he comes with a para, right? That means you're going to get me a para from admin. No, it doesn't go that way. Paras are hard to get. Paras are, are well-intended, wonderful people, but likely not going to be able to handle the complexity of what Heather just went through. And having kids who are high-functioning in many ways have a para with them is often not the best way either, right? So that's not going to really work either, transdisciplinary. So that's sort of like an idea, but a, a very limited way to go as well. 
So we started thinking about the interdisciplinary team approach. The interdisciplinary team approach is a concept where you're combining academic disciplines and you are creating something new by crossing boundaries. There is shared responsibility, there is interaction between the disciplines, um, and it requires a lot of communication, it requires a lot of collaboration. There, there is an experience that I had in my district where we were doing interdisciplinary assessments with our kids that were the most complicated. They were the ones staffed into our ILC programs, so they had either medical issues or very significant um, issues of, of TBI, autism. And we practiced interdisciplinary on a regular basis. And as we go forward with you all thinking about how you're going to manage your kids with traumatic brain injury, I'm going to throw out this model as a way to think differently and be very creative with these kids. Because if you remember, this isn't something any one person can do. This is something that your team needs to work on together. So an interdisciplinary model is going to get your teams working more closely, more creatively, and working smarter, not harder, not more time, but very thoughtful and useful with your time. So the way that the, we, that we worked this out is, um, is, is when we would go forward with these complicated kids, of course, what are we trying to really look at here? Well, one thing, of course, is eligibility. That's why we're all here, right? But why do we want to do eligibility? What is the purpose of saying that this kiddo has this label versus that label? Well, tracking, all of that kind of thing. But day to day, in terms of serving these children, what we're really trying to figure out in our assessments is how to intervene and why and who, all of those things. So really to direct the interventions and to make the plan very meaningful and purposeful for each student is really the, the goal. We'll still get to that tippy top of that, of that pyramid, but we're going to do it because we're really thinking about the whole child. So we would have these meetings um, where we would, we would want to ask the question, why are we doing the testing, and what's really the issue with these students? So for example, about a month before a triennial review would come up, we would actually have a meeting prior to that date. And at that meeting, we would ask the questions, what do we really need to assess this time? In that meeting, we would pull together all the important stakeholders. So the parents, the student, of course the teachers, related services, but anyone else in the community that was also involved in this child's life. Mental health, juvenile diversion, anybody else that had or vocational, a boss, anything like that, to really ask the questions. Because you know, if you've worked in a high school, for example, as you approach a triennial with a complicated kid, doing another cognitive is not going to necessarily give us the answers that we need. How is that going to impact what's going to happen when they get to transition and what's going to, what they really need to work on in the precious two years we have left? So we would pull together everybody and we would ask the questions, what do we really need to be looking at? And we would give ourselves permission to not necessarily just do all the same tests over and over, but to do but to do what tests we needed to do to answer the questions. So we would um, put everyone together and we would go through this child's strengths and, and weaknesses. And strengths always just to build rapport, get the parents bragging on their kid, talk about all the good things that these kids can do, and then also talk about what are the concerns. He's, in, uh, he's a 10th grader and now we gotta start thinking about transition. He, you know, all of these other concerns, not just academics, I can guarantee you it is rare that one of the concerns that would come up, you know, would be, I absolutely need another cognitive test. This is his fourth. You know, that there were often other questions that I, as a school psychologist, could answer. And so we would think strengths and concerns, and we would think functionally across all different communities, not just school, but home and um, community, work, environment. Um, and that gets back to kind of the question of academics versus educational impact in general, the whole child. We would come up with about five concerns and that we'd say, okay, th these are really the questions. For this evaluation, this is really what we want to know. We would come up with about five questions and we would say, who's going to go answer those questions? We would assign those to various stakeholders. Not by discipline, but by creatively. There are things that parents could gather for us, information. There are different ways that we could use our staff to answer certain questions. So we would say, who's going to come back with the answers to these questions? And then we would come back in a month 
with the answers to these questions. And we would, we would report back. What did we find? What were the answers to these questions? And based upon what we found, we would then develop our interventions and then, of course, move forward in the way that we always do, progress monitoring, you know, time sensitive, all of that, making sure that we were implementing our plan. All right? Um, and who would, you know, who would teach it? Who would reinforce it? How do we make sure that this is generalized across home, community, and school? For kids who have these really deep issues, um, you have to generalize it across these different settings. If you do it in just one setting, you're not necessarily going to have the impact that you need to have for them to take this somewhere else outside of your setting. So that was kind of the idea behind it. Um, let me show you how this really worked in theory, in, in, in practice, on a kid um, as we went through the process. So I'm going to tell you the story of Colin. Colin was a 15-year-old 10th grade student um, at the high school that I was at. He had sustained an acquired brain injury at the age of 12, the end of his sixth grade year. The story behind his acquired brain injury is that he was a kiddo with underlying issues of depression and anxiety um, through his middle school years. Parents had him, or elementary, or elementary and into middle school, parents had him on, um, at one point, three different medications. And mom felt uncomfortable with him being on these three different medications, so she called the psychiatrist and said, you know, I think that we need to relook at these meds. Can we take him off some of these meds? And the psychiatrist, the story is, told the mom, well, yeah, go ahead and take him off of one. And she said, well, which one? And he said, I don't know, just whichever one. Pick one, take him off of it. So she did. And within a week or two, his depression came back. He started spiraling down, and his demeanor changed. And one night, mom and dad were out, and they came home, and they found Colin hanging from the, like the rafters. And the, they had a loft in their house. And he was still alive, but he had, he had crushed his trachea, and he had had an anoxic injury. So he was in the hospital for quite a period of time. So there was no question there was a significant injury. He was staffed with acquired brain injury because it was not traumatic, right? Um, and you, can you imagine mom's guilt and her grieving of this, even though anybody here in this room would say it was not fair of that psychiatrist to tell her to pick which, which one to come off of, right? So before all of this, though, before he got staffed in, he was a very high achieving kid, really no issues. We had no baseline data on him. He didn't have any learning issues before. And he was really into science, had some really big plans for himself as he got, uh, got on through his life. I'm just going to jump right in here, Karen. Mm -hmm. So just a reminder, even though obviously a traumatic event, correct? A non-traumatic injury, um, anoxic, lack of oxygen is a non-traumatic brain injury. So um, still under the umbrella of acquired brain injury, but it's a non-traumatic, so we wouldn't be able to go down the road of... TBI for the special ed category, right? So just to want to reiterate that category. Yep. At that time, uh, physically handicapped. Okay, so spent a good time in the hospital following the suicide attempt, ABI, physically handicapped, right? Um, managed, of course, with physical handicap, it's the same thing as our, our current issue that we just talked about with TBI, right? There are not case managers, per se, for physical handicap. Um, so he was case managed by our speech language person and serviced with some supports from learning, um, learning disabilities. And we happened to have the magnet program that had the um, deaf and hard of hearing. So we also crossed over and he was in some of those classes and that teacher helped us quite a bit. So again, there's that village, right? Um, the thing that was complicated with Colin is that he was in the juvenile diversion program. So after all of this happened in his recovery, um, he had a situation where he was, um, in the summer, he went over to a neighbor's house, a friend of his, so the boy was of his same age, but that boy had a younger sibling, a little girl. And Colin has this issue where he likes to take a cloth material and tie it around your eyes. And he tied that around the little girl's eyes and it scared her. There was nothing that happened between them that we could tell, but of course it was concerning to both families and so um, they had made the decision that they were going to put him in the diversion program and teach him the risk cycle, you know, which is, you know, being able to trigger your, you know, your own thoughts or your behaviors that are going to lead you down to this and change that so that you don't continue on through these behaviors that will get you into, the, into this kind of trouble. So he was 
um, in this diversion program kind of as a gift and, you know, let's not, let's not, you know, let's try to divert this or let's try to intervene and not make this a serious issue. And then what ended up happening right before his triennial is that he had just reoffended. He had reoffended by, we were trying to get him involved with their typical peers. He was working on the school play and he was back behind the scenes, like back behind in the theater, um, you know, the props and behind the curtains. And there was a girl back there, same age, a peer. And he did the same thing where he took a, piece, a cloth and he tied it around her eyes and it scared her. And again, so the juvenile diversion officer is concerned about this. Now, now do we need to stop the diversion and go further um, and actually, you know, start to go down the process of more DYC kinds of things with this kiddo. So the questions for Colin um, is obviously not a cognitive, right? Um, and some of the guiding questions that we're going to introduce to you here, you're actually going to do with cases this afternoon. So these guiding questions, what was the reason for the referral? Well, yes, he had a triennial coming up, but really more importantly, we needed to do an IEP review at this point. We, um, and there was a lot of questions that juvenile diversion was sort of looking to us to answer about what do we do with this kid, given that the ABI. So the big questions, of course, is was he, can, was he just making a bad choice? to continue to do this behavior even though we've taught him this risk cycle um, and he's just choosing not to do it. Um, of course, the parents had questions about what are we going to do with him after high school because here we are in 10th grade and we still, we've got these issues. Um, is he ever going to be able to be socially adaptive, vocationally um, successful after high school? Of course, there were concerns about overall mental health. There were pre-injury and so now what are we dealing with with all of this? And then, yes, what were his academic abilities at this point. Um, so, so those are kind of the questions that we start with. What information do we need to get? Is it formal information? Is it informal information? Um, what, you know, disabilities are we considering? So this is where we started doing our interdisciplinary assessment. And you will see how that assessment or how that program or approach, I'd say, I should say, lends itself to answering these questions. Um, what, did the, what was the information that we found? How then did that um, direct our interventions, and what happened with Colin. So here's what we did. We pulled everyone together, including diversion, um, and we had this meeting where we talked about his strengths and his weaknesses. So he had some great strengths in his language arts classes. He was struggling in math. He, um, and his CSAPs, you can see there, show that same kind of a pattern. In terms of his testing earlier, um, with um, language testing, you see that there's that inconsistency or that difference, unevenness on the expressive versus receptive with 116 to 96. His earlier WISC showed the kind of typical pattern that you see with a kid with a brain injury, whether it's acquired or traumatic, where often your verbal and your performance, your, your, your larger domains are going to look okay, but when you start looking at processing speed and working memory, that's where you start to sometimes see that those are lower than the overall scores. So the inconsistency within the domain. And then in terms of just things about Colin, he was a good kid. He tried to please. He could be very, very cooperative with um, his teachers, with his um, sibling, and he always wanted to help out. But of course, the concerns that we were having, his teachers were concerned that currently, recently he was having some work completion problems. He had some very poor social skills and obviously tying it uh, a handkerchief around someone's eyes when they're saying no is a poor social skill um, and or is this an ability to inhibit an internal response, something going on there. So he had some very rigid thinking, he had no sense of humor, and of course juvenile diversion was wondering is this risk cycle treatment very effective or not? So the questions that we came up with from this evaluation was, um, let's start with an easy one, work completion. Is, he, does he, is it that he can't do the work or is he just a typical kid who sometimes doesn't want to do the work? Okay, so it's a can't versus won't. Or is that he can't get himself started? Or is it that he can't attend long enough to figure out what the work is, which is the you know, foundational attentional issue? Or is it that he knows what the work is but he can't remember to do it? Is it a memory issue? Okay. Poor social skills, well obviously there are some issues with he's beginning to get into conflicts with teachers about some of the work and he's got some issues with his peers. Um, and so we started to ask the question, is that a visual cue problem, which I think you mentioned earlier. They can't read the, you know, what's on someone's face in terms of, you know, no means no. Um, 
Is it a, of course, a language problem, receptive, or expressive, receptive, or, or social pragmatic? Or is it just some, you know, some of your kids on the spectrum have this kind of overinflated sense of justice? You know, it's just like, that's that, that in, um, inability to kind of flex your thinking kind of thing. So was it that? The rigid thinking, we worried about that. Um, he had trouble with transitions and, cha and changes. Um, is that just stubbornness? Is that just a typical kid? Or were there really some mental inflexibility or executive pro function problems there? No sense of humor. Well, we decided that of all of the questions and concerns, this was not really a big one. Um, lots of people, adults, have no sense of humor. This wasn't going to make or break it for him in terms of his life. So we didn't put a lot of energy on that one. And then, of course, we really wanted to answer this question for juvenile diversion. Is this a cognitive issue? Was he really just not no, understanding that risk cycle? Was he understanding it, but he just didn't want to practice it? Just making a choice to not do it. Um, was it a language issue? Did we need to teach it a different way? Did he learn it, but he couldn't remember it? Was he not attending? Or the attention issue that, we had, that Heather had talked about, you know, a big part of attention is you can attend, but then you have this impulse that just is so compelling that you can't ignore that impulse. So that impulse goes with attention. So was it that he just could not re reject that impulse? Or did he know it in one situation, but he couldn't generalize it in another situation? So I know not to do it in my neighbor's house. I didn't think not to do it behind you know, the theater. So we came up with those questions, and we made a plan for who was going to answer these questions and how we were going to assess this. We had a month to do it, and we were going to come back at the date of the triennial date and answer these questions. So in terms of the work completion, we really had to assess, was he able to do the work? Um, and we, had this, um, we got the general ed and the special ed teacher to work on this plan where you ta we talked to Colin at kind of instructional level, you know, where he wasn't frust frustrated, you know, confidence level. And then the next week, we taught at a higher level, frustration level, and then confidence level, then frustration level. And we just went back and forth one week, one week, one week, just to kind of see what kind of output we would get as we, in, as we changed the demands of the task. Okay? And then I felt like I wanted to do a little bit of testing in terms of the attention, in terms of memory. And if I pulled out a whisk, I would have gotten the same scores we already had. So I pulled out a Nepsi, I pulled out a Stroop, I pulled out parts of the Rammel. So this is the, where you sort of get into this issue with the matrix um, that you all have a copy of. There are certain kinds of tests where you can really ask the question and drill down using certain tests that you already have access to in a lot of what you already do for testing. Poor social skills, so we wanted to know if this was a social pragmatic issue. So we had our speech language person do the test of uh, problem solving, and then we um, we wanted to see if it was this fairness issue. So we had the parents um, do, do situations where they would just give things to the, to the younger daughter, and he didn't get it. So it was just unfair, and just see how he handled that. We had the juvenile diversion um, officer, or they had sort of a group setting, just kind of play around a little bit with, you know, these group members got this. Oh, and Colin, you don't. And just see how he could handle the in, inequality of, of fairness kind of thing. Rigid thinking, um, we wanted to kind of see how that was going to impact him vocationally. We did the vocational screen. And we also asked him to run a couple passes where um, we wanted to set up a little bit of frustration. So on a, on a particular day, we had him come out of the deaf and hard of hearing classroom to run a pass to the office. And I would stand at that office door and say, there's a big meeting going on there. Colin can't get in there. Sorry, you can't deliver that pass to Ms. Johnson this morning. It's not going to happen. What would, he what would he do with the frustration? How would he handle the inability to complete his task? So we tried a couple of different things where we sort of frustrated him and um, see what he would do with that, that increased level of frustration. Juvenile diversion, we wanted to see, did he really understand the risk cycle? And so the juvenile diversion officer made sure that he recited it. And then I also made sure that he could recite it to me. So you know, was, he understood it. So what was the issue then with that? So we came back after a month of everybody going out and doing their assignments and trying to answer these questions. And what we found was that Colin was a typical teenager. If you taught him to a level that he could understand it, he could do the work, um, it was fine. If it was at a frustration level, he didn't want to do the work, um, that was typical. It got harder, and, and lot, like a lot of our kids, if it got harder, they just didn't want to do it. 
So that was not a brain injury issue. That was just typical teenager. We did some testing with his um, ability on, on inhibition with the NEPSI. His ability to inhibit was very poor. He could not resist temptations or, or, or thoughts that would override, even in testing. So when you're doing testing with that, you're, you know, I want you to, you know, tell me the tell me the color, not the word. He couldn't override the easier response, which is just to read the word kind of thing. Um, memory was average um, verbal memory, but and but visual memory was much lower. And then when you looked at delayed memory over time, there was a real decline. So what you were teaching him now was not necessarily sticking over time, and you couldn't be sure that what you had taught him was still there a little bit later. It would require much more reinforcement. In terms of speech language, his pragmatic, pragmatic testing, of course, was what we would expect lower than his actual receptive or expressive language, and um, even that was a difference between those two. And then in terms of getting him to understand the fairness, he really did have a very difficult time if other people got things that he didn't. He would express that. He couldn't say why. It just was unfair. So he didn't have a lot of empathy that other people could get things that he couldn't. Um, so that's what came out of that. Um, we did some vocational testing. Um, we thought it might be better to start with him in kind of a more individual setting than a, a large group setting um, to start some of the vocational training for him. Um, we noticed that when we send him on passes and we frustrated him, he just could not, his cognitive skills just really deteriorated. He could not think or problem solve what the next step is. How do I get this pass to so-and-so? Who do I go talk to to get through this process? Sense of humor, as I said, we really just didn't answer that question because it wasn't that important to get to. And then he was proficient in the steps of reciting the risk cycle. Um, he just couldn't generalize them. So if you asked him over and over, the cognitive, the easy cognitive question, you know, tell me these steps, he could do them. But it was obviously then not being implemented. So when you look at all of the issues that we looked at for him, what became a big issue, what rose to the top? Well, in terms of the risk cycle, it was a generalization issue. That was supposed to go to the top. <laughs> and that would be where we would start with our interventions, right? Um, um, language, um, <laughs> I don't know why that went down to the bottom. Language is a bit of an issue. When it came to pragmatics, that was, of course, something that we had to be more aware of. He could talk a good game, basically, is what you said earlier, but he really wasn't understanding the social language. Memory was an issue. We, what we uncovered from this is that you can't assume that what you were teaching him was sticking because it was, it was decaying over time. And his ability to inhibit impulses was an issue. Um, and that the risk cycle part that we were teaching him was just not enough to, to, lay, to, to inhibit that impulse. And so he was acting upon it, and that was coming out of his behavior. Given what we found on this evaluation, and that it was not a can't versus won't. So it wasn't that he was just a bad kid who was choosing to go about this, you know, what he wanted to do, except for his work, which typical kids do then we could come up with a plan that was very helpful for Colin. And what ended up happening from it is that we took all what we learned and we made a plan very specific for him. We did some vocational training for him. Um, we had to do some working with him on empathy, not getting your way, how other people can get things that you can't, those kinds of basic things that you would think a 15-year-old would have. We started using some cognitive behavior kinds of um, interventions, strategies, um, teaching him that, you know, the world isn't fair in all ways and therefore you sometimes have to kind of work through some of those distorted thoughts. Delaying gratification, beginning to use those CBT thought, um, processes to, to inhibit responses like stop, relax, and think, those kinds of things so that he could inhibit that. Um, his parents got him a CBT ther therapist which helped and then we all spoke the same language though. And the other thing is you want to use the same words. Um, started working on some mental flexibility and working in you know, cooperative kinds of settings, some verbal and um, problem solving kinds of um, strategies so that he could get a job, he could keep a job. We felt like at this point he needed to learn some of these things from people other than parents and from teachers. He needed to get a boss because sometimes they learn these things better from them. 
mindful balance between easy and hard work, but kept pushing him with the hard work, just like everybody else. He could do it. He didn't like to do it, but he could do it. And then we know what to do with that. If he does work he doesn't like to do, then you reinforce for that, and you give consequences if you know he can do the work, but he just chooses not to. That's just typical teen stuff. Um, so, and that's just went into that whole thing about life is not fair. You have to do your, your algebra, whatever it is that he was working on. For juvenile diversion, what we really learned was that while he could recite the steps to you backwards and forwards, he was really not understanding it in, in the context of really being able to apply it, to inhibit the response, to when to apply it, to generalize it to other settings. And so we um, decided that we would go back and reteach this from the perspective that um, he, you know, the same language with juvenile diversion, the same language at home, the same language at school, to try to get this to be a stronger skill and not do the one thing that where we started, which was to say, you blew your chance at diversion and now you're going down this towards, I don't know what the next step would be, you would know better than I, but we averted it so we didn't have to go there. But a kid with this history, I don't think is a kid that we want in the DYC setting. That's not gonna help this kid down the road. So we were able to kind of reset and go back and really use the, the two years that we had with him very productively as he finished off his high school years because his last triennial asked these questions and answered these questions and the interventions were very purposeful then. Okay? So what would, how would it have been different if we had a multidisciplinary team? I likely would have done a WISC speech language would have done itself. We would have all had that same information and they would have all gone off and we wouldn't have answered the question for diversion and I don't think that we would have helped this kid have a different outcome. Transdisciplinary, he was not a kid that was gonna have a pair of following him and even if that were the case, a pair is not gonna follow him after school in the theater so that wouldn't have you know, changed that outcome. There were things missing on our interdisciplinary team. We didn't have any medical voice on our, men, our interdisciplinary team. The mental health issue was still a question. That, of course, parents were very concerned about jumping back into. They wanted nothing to do with medications. They were very dis distrustful of the mental health world. So we just didn't have that component there. But that might be something that had, has to, at some point, be dealt with in terms of your ability to, you know, like, um, you know, inhibit a, an impulse that's almost like a compulsion. Um, and we didn't have anyone from the work setting because he wasn't in the work setting yet, but if he were for the next evaluation, if we had a chance to do it again, we would probably involve a boss or someone who could speak to how does this really generalize outside of the school and the home setting. So that is how we use the interdisciplinary team approach. People ask me all the time at this, well, given that amount of time, I mean, that sounds, it sounds great, it sounds fun, but how did that impact you with time? Well, the, the parts that you saw that I had to do, as I can only speak to that, was no more time than it would take me to do a whisk. On the average, an hour and 15, an hour and a half, my time with Colin was much more about small parts of testing and working with my teachers to set up situations where I could be at the door and we could run passes and we could do these different things. So there were other times where we would do interdisciplinary um, assessments on kids and they never needed a cognitive and there were no behavioral questions. So in those cases, I really wasn't that involved. We just carried over my other, my other testing. and So it's a give and take. It's not more testing, it's not more time, it's just very purposeful testing and very purposeful assessments and it's a shared team responsibility. And that's what I love about this interdisciplinary. And given that I don't have kids to give these to, I mean, a TBI person or a TBI place, this is probably a good way to think about managing many of your complicated kids. So think about it, digest it a little bit. We'll go through some more cases as we go through this. Um, and um, yeah, just kind of think about it.